This is RTV6 News at 11, working for you. Good evening to you here at 11 o'clock. Well, for the first time in five months, some Marion County students will physically go to school tomorrow. And all students are preparing for remote learning either every day or three days out of the week. Remote learning can be a huge change for many families. RTV6 reporter Cameron Riddle introduces us to a tutor who is offering tips and assistance on how to thrive in this new normal. On the night before school begins for thousands of students in Marion County, not everyone will physically go to a school building tomorrow. Some will have school at home via a computer or tablet. And while that may be the safer option in a pandemic, it's also a headache for many students and their parents. So the biggest thing that I've heard from parents is that I'm not the teacher. I I'm not the teacher. My child can't learn from me or I didn't learn that or this way. So how am I supposed to, you know, digest it and give it back to my child? Makayla Rice has taught every age group from K through 12 and even college classes and knows from experience that a computer at home can't replace a teacher in the classroom. That's why this teacher turned tutor is running her own business aimed at helping families survive e-learning. At Elite Scholars, we can do everything for the scholar and for the parent. And when I mean everything, I literally mean come in the home or come in your space make the space, you know, adequate for learning and conducive to learning. When it comes to school at home, Rice says the key to success is making sure home feels like school. I, if the space is not conducive to learning, I can't learn. So that means if it's noisy, I can't learn. If it's too cold, I can't learn. Rice says the computer itself won't be anything new to most students, as many of them already do a lot of their schoolwork on a computer. She stresses it's the environment that makes a difference, especially for younger students. She encourages parents to think about the messages and tools on the wall of a classroom and put those on display at home. Whether the learning takes place in a classroom or at a kitchen table, this classroom teacher and at-home tutor advises families to keep a routine. Get up, put your clothes on. If you if you wore a uniform, put your uniform on. If you wore regular clothes, put your clothes on, brush your teeth, have breakfast, have recess, and most of all, breathe. In Indianapolis, Cameron Riddle, RTV6. And Marion County districts that have decided to offer in-person learning for the beginning of the year will still have students learning remote. An order from the Marion County Health Department says students in grades 6 through 12 must split their time between physical school and e-learning with only half the student body in school at one time. That will allow for more social distancing both in school and on buses. Many students and teachers taking part in in-person learning are already dealing with classmates or co-workers who have tested positive for COVID-19. Brownsburg Community Schools confirms one case at the high school. The district did not publicly announce if the person who tested positive is a student or a staff member. Officials say they have taken steps to contact Trace. And a second staff member at Avon High School has tested positive. Unlike the first case there, this person may have had close contact with some students. One parent who asked not to be identified tells RTV6 she feels there is a lack of accountability for keeping students and staff safe. The health department, the health department says, you know, we leave that up to the school officials. You contact the school officials and they say, well, we're going off the guidance of the health department. So as a parent, I really don't know what it is. So it seems like somebody bigger, uh, like the governor, needs to step in and give some clear explanation and understanding, help us understand who's making these decisions and why uh, when it's our children. We also spoke to the president of the Avon Federation of Teachers. She's afraid more students and staff will test positive in the coming days and weeks. We have English and world language classes that are at least 30 kids. So we are sitting elbow to elbow as if it's business as usual. And we are armed with masks and some kitchen cleaner and some hand sanitizer. And that is it. Susie Lebo says there is no clear guidance from the district or health department on what additional steps are being taken to keep the community safe or when a full shutdown would happen. District leaders declined an interview request. We also reached out to the health department and we are waiting to hear back. 
Join us Thursday night for an RTV6 special taking a look at how Hoosier kids are heading safely back to school. We're asking lawmakers what they're doing to hold schools accountable, finding out what you can expect if your child is returning to the classroom, and much more. Again, that's Thursday at 7.30 p.m. only on RTV6. Fans who still have tickets for this year's Indianapolis 500 will be credited for the 2021 race. We learned this afternoon spectators will not be allowed at the track for the Indy 500 on August 23rd. Indianapolis Motor Speedway says the number of coronavirus cases in Marion County has tripled since June 26 when it was announced. Capacity for the race would be restricted to 25%. In that same amount of time, the positivity rate has doubled. That led to the difficult decision to close this year's race to fans. RTV6 Sports Director Dave First talked to the president of Penske Entertainment about the reversal. It's an agonizing decision, I know Doug would say, from the perspective of delivering for our fans and all the work that's gone into this. But it was a pretty easy decision based on the data, and we always said we'd make the decision based on the data. It was already announced that the race will not be blacked out locally. The closure will not only impact IMS, it will also impact the town of Speedway. The owner of Dawson's on Main hopes fans will still come out on race day to support local businesses. We've been here for 15 years and obviously we look forward to May every year and this year we were looking, for, looking forward to August. The town of Speedway released a statement encouraging people to support local businesses that may be impacted by the change. People struggling to pay their bills could pay, face an added setback starting next week. A statewide moratorium on disconnecting utilities is set to expire on August 14th. Paying those bills will be more difficult for many people, like Crystal Gibson. She's not working right now, while remote, remote learning and quarantining have led to much higher usage rates. Always going around trying to keep lights off, but you know, the TV's going more. Uh, the Chromebooks. There's tens of thousands of Hoosiers right now sort of at risk of losing service should that should that moratorium be lifted. This really shines a light on the fact that uh, folks do struggle uh, to pay their bills even before the pandemic and the financial consequences of the pandemic. Kerwin Olson with the Consumer Advocacy Group Citizens Action Coalition says he plans on asking the governor to extend that moratorium once again. Now to the latest on the toll. The pandemic is taking on Hoosier lives. 2,794 people in Indiana have died from the virus. 14 newly reported deaths happened between July 29th and yesterday. In that same span, 836 positive cases have been reported. A man convicted of murdering an IU student will not be getting out of prison or getting a new trial. Today, the U.S. Court of Appeals overturned a lower court's decision to release John Myers. He is serving a 65-year prison sentence for the murder of 19-year-old Jill Bierman. Myers' attorneys argued that his trial lawyer did a poor job representing him. The appeals court agreed the lawyer was deficient, but said the state's case against Myers was too strong to overturn the verdict. Bierman disappeared in May of 2000. Her remains were found three years later. We are 14 weeks away from the general election, and while officials work on plans to help Hoosiers vote during a pandemic, groups are working to make sure everyone knows they have the right to vote. RTV6's Cornelia Hawker shows you which groups they are reaching out to. After election day or after the deadline to register to vote, we were receiving uh, requests for people wondering if they had the right to vote, and oftentimes they did have the right to vote. That's Katie Blair, ACLU of Indiana's Director of Advocacy and Public Policy, explaining why they started the Yes, You Can Vote campaign back in 2018. They target this voting education to specific groups. We receive a, a ton of requests for information from previously incarcerated Hoosiers who would like to know what their rights are at the voting booth. Voting rights in Indiana are restored when a person gets out of jail or prison. The only time they can't vote is when they're serving their sentence. An individual who is on parole or probation or even in jail waiting trial, they have the right to vote. Katie says that's something anyone impacted by the justice system should be aware of. She also says the ACLU gets questions about voting from some of those in the LGBTQ community. Transgender people have a lot of concerns when they go to the polls, primarily being outed. If the fear of being outed, either having their gender identity pointed out or being misgendered doesn't keep trans folk from voting, the fear of a poll worker not accepting their ID might also keep them from voting. Katie says they need to hear this. Folks need to know that they 
um, all they have to do is be registered at the, with the name that is on their legal state-issued ID, and they ha should have no problems at the polls. If you're a person who happens to have some sort of disability, Katie says you need to know there are accommodations you can request so you can exercise your right to vote. Voters that require assistance at the polls can designate a friend, family member, or a trained poll worker to help them fill out their ballot. I asked why the ACLU was targeting these specific groups, informing them of their right to vote, and Katie said it's simple. We wanted to make sure that we can educate people so that they're the, they know going into November all of their rights and are able to make their voices heard on election day. Working for you, Cornelius Hawker, RTV6. And college students and recently naturalized citizens are also groups the ACLU of Indiana is hoping to inform with their Yes, You Can Vote campaign. Students can register to vote wherever they consider home, and naturalized citizens have the same right to vote as someone who was born in the United States. The Pacers winning ways continue as the team continues to shine in Orlando. Next, highlights and reaction from another blue and gold victory. And look at this, temperature down to 58 already in Terre Haute, where temperatures will be in the 40s in the morning. This is RTV6 News at 11, working for you. The Pacers' time in Orlando includes just one set of games on back-to-back -back days. The second of those consecutive dates came this evening, but the blue and gold kept rolling along. Brad Brown now with a look. Any signs of the Pacers missing a beat on the second game of a back-to-back -back were taken care of very quickly on Tuesday. They scored the first 10 points against the Magic, opened up a 20-point lead just eight minutes into the game. T.J. Warren continued putting up the best scoring numbers in the bubble. He tallied 17 points in the opening quarter, hitting all six of his field goals. The Pacers led 43-22 at the first quarter break. The rest of the game was just filled with a bunch of solid performances. Miles Turner scored 21 points. He added six rebounds was very strong on the defensive end as well. Pacers kept that 21-point lead at halftime. Victor Oladipo back in action after Monday off. He scored 13 points in 27 minutes. T.J. McConnell was the extra spark on Tuesday. Came off the bench to score a dozen points. He had five assists to go with that. Just brought another level of energy during his time on the floor. But it was Warren savoring the spotlight once again. 32 points on 13 of 17 shooting. He leads the league with 190. 19 points in three bubble games. That total also ties the Pacers' all-time three-game record. 120 to 109 the final when it was done. The Pacers seem to keep improving in Orlando. Yeah, I mean, I always felt like uh, I was definitely capable of just staying consistent with it. And um, definitely during the quarantine, I was able to to really, whenever I could get in the gym, really just work on my shots. I was able to know playing against my body, so he wanted to just work on something like that. Everybody came in in really good shape. Everybody was ready to hoop. Everybody knew what the circumstances were. And um, we're just playing well together like we have been all season, you know, so playing with multiple multiple uh, starting lineups and, uh, you know, different guys out there. You know, it's just kind of oh. in the moment, just excited that we're, oh. we're playing well. And, uh, yeah. After he's back as well. After Tuesday's results, the Pacers remain just a game back of Miami. The Heat beat Boston, so that gap is now just one and a half games to third place in the East. Four plays five and three plays six in the playoffs, so some big games coming up in the days ahead. The Pacers play Phoenix on Thursday. The Suns are also 3-0 in the bubble. Brad Brown, RTV6 Sports. An Indianapolis gym owner wants to help Hoosiers manage the stress of the pandemic through the power of yoga. Taylor Made Wellness on the Near East Side, close to the old Angie's List campus, is offering free yoga classes twice a week. Anyone can participate. Kelsey Taylor says this is her way of supporting the community during this difficult time. I want to have an impact in this community. I want this community to remember us. Of course, we want them to patronize us. But we also want them to remember us as a place, as a safe haven for them to go to when they needed a way to live a healthier, happier lifestyle. We definitely have been affected by 
the pandemic financially and also socially too, because it's just very different now. And, um, you know, we're a very outgoing couple, so we like to be out and about and talk to people and, um, we can't do that. So it's it definitely been, it had a big impact on us. The free classes are at six o'clock on Tuesday and Thursday evenings. For more information, go to the Taylor made wellness indie Facebook page. And Kevin, it was a gorgeous night for some yoga. And I know you've been practicing some poses, right? She's trying to teach me some poses. Those are for commercial breaks. Uh, I'm right though, right? Part of it is the mood setting. And so this is a beautiful sunset this evening. And before the sun rises, temperatures will dip into the 40s in spots. It's 58 right now in Terre Haute. That's the cool spot, 59 in Sullivan. We'll all be lower 50s to upper 40s. The air is dry, the sky is clear, and the wind relatively light. That's the recipe for near record temperatures in the metro area. That north wind will be about 5 to 10 miles per hour first thing in the morning. Okay, the record low, 1974, 51. 52 is our predicted low temperature in Indy, well below the average of 65 degrees. Here's some 40s for you. Logansport to Kokomo and Marion, 49 in Vetersburg. Terre Haute may make it there as well. Other temperatures along Interstate 70 right at 50 uh, for the temperature. Amanda's taking off her shoes, so I think maybe she's getting ready for a yoga pose here. Temperatures in the 50s the next couple of mornings, not just tomorrow morning. Dry Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday four days in a row before we get our chance for showers and thunderstorms later in the weekend. It's pretty obvious warming trend, but these next couple of days, really through Friday, low humidity levels. The humidity comes back Saturday, but it's really back on Sunday. That's when you'll step outside and feel that tropical air. Temperatures in the 70s tomorrow, and just like today, we'll end up with a mixture of clouds and sunshine in the afternoon. I think we'll have absolute sunshine in the morning. Then the cumulus clouds build during the afternoon hours. Thursday, a little bit warmer. We make our move toward 80 degrees, probably fall short in many spots, about 79 in the metro area. Friday, 83 for the high, again with plenty of sunshine and the humidity remains low. As we step into the weekend, temperatures turn it up a notch. We're back to average or above. 85 and dry Saturday, Sunday 87 for the high temperature, and not so subtly, these overnight lows that it will be so enjoyable the next three mornings will become much warmer as we get to early next week. Temperatures back to around 70 or so for the overnight low. <laughs> there it is. There's my dismount. There we go. We finally saw it. And I don't know what he was talking about. Shoes are on. Scenes like this are what we would usually see on National Night Out. Now, the annual event encourages police and community members to get together under positive circumstances. And instead of canceling this year, many local law enforcement agencies are getting creative as the pandemic continues. This evening, Whitestown police officers drove through neighborhoods waving at homeowners and families from a safe distance. Officers and residents say it's important to maintain community connections. I thought it was really cool that they did that um, instead of having, having a parade so then people could still um, experience something fun. Especially not being able to go into schools like we normally do and just with this whole social distancing thing that we're trying to be a leader in the community to enforce. Um, seeing all the kids out, I mean, I know it touched every officer's heart and just made us feel that much more welcome and really just reassured us that uh, not only the kids but the community as a whole has our back. Some communities and law enforcement agencies are rescheduling their national night, national night out events to October 6th. A new facility that connects generations in a unique way is set to open later this month. We're getting an inside look at the new child care facility at the Mini Hartman Center on Vermont Street near Michigan on the near east side of Indianapolis. Eight vacant school classrooms have been transformed into early learning areas. Eventually, children will interact with senior adults who live in a different part of the center. Through innovative intergenerational programming, this incredible state-of-the-art facility will provide opportunities for our older generations to interact with our youngest generations, allowing them to connect, encourage, and to learn from one another. The city, the United Way of Central Indiana, and the Lilly Endowment and Cummins played significant roles in funding this $1.8 million project. We'll be right back right after this.
This is RTV6 News at 11, working for you. The Colorado Police Department is facing new controversy tonight. A mother says officers pulled a gun on her before detaining and handcuffing her family, including children. ABC's Ramita Puga reports the traffic stop started with a case of a mistaken stolen vehicle. Anger and confusion with Aurora, Colorado's police department after officers swarmed the wrong car in a stolen vehicle investigation, forcing two black women and their daughters to the ground and even handcuffing the children. Me Gilliam and her sister, six-year-old daughter and teenage nieces were out for a girl's day at a nail salon when they were approached by cops. Kid, what they saying, it's protocol. That's not protocol. You protocol, you, every time you do a traffic stop, you're going to pull your gun on someone. That's your protocol. That's not protocol. Police say a license plate scanner incorrectly alerted them that Gilliam's car was stolen. This video shows the children, ranging from 6 to 17 years old, lying on their stomachs in a parking lot, several of them handcuffed. They can be heard crying and screaming as officers surround them. <laughs> Police then determined they had stopped the wrong vehicle. There's no excuse why you didn't knock on a window and just say, hey, I need to see your license and registration. Officers later announced that the vehicle they were looking for shared the same license plate with Gilliam's car, but was an out-of-state motorcycle, not a car. The Aurora PD apologized. So the mistake is that um, the officer was going off of what dispatch told them that was confirmed. So he was acting in good faith that that was confirmed. Gilliam says she doesn't want an apology, but wants Aurora police to do better. Stop. Just last month, three Aurora Stop. police officers were fired Stop. and one resigned after posing for pictures yeah. making fun of the chokehold used on 23-year-old Elijah McLean, who died after his encounter with police. Last night, the city of Aurora named a permanent police chief who some community leaders say will inherit a department in desperate need of fixing. In Colorado, Romina Puga, ABC News. Those cases in Aurora and many around the country are part of the ongoing national dialogue about racial disparities in policing and society. We want to help continue the conversation. So every Tuesday this month, RTV6 and Radio 1 will host a discussion exploring racial issues in central Indiana. On the 11th, panelists will talk about the current racial climate in our community. The discussion starts at 5 p.m. on the RTV6 Facebook page next Tuesday. A piece of history is moving to Lawrence. The Fort Bend Cultural Campus will be the new home to an historic communications building decommissioned from Fort Benjamin Harrison. The building will become part of the Visual Arts Center at the campus. The group Arts for Lawrence is in the process of making the move. The building will be home to a gallery, art classroom, studios, and more. Construction on the cultural campus is expected to wrap up in January of 20. 23, a very careful move there, Kevin. Ah, what a great day tomorrow. Cool start in the morning, mild finish, lots of sunshine. Whether it's on that moving house or your house, you can have the windows open all day. Temperatures into the mid-70s, maybe a little warmer with some fair weather clouds in the afternoon. Great day with more to come. Amanda? A lot to look forward to there. Thanks for making our TV6 your choice for news. Good morning, Indiana starts at 430. Thanks for joining us. Good night.